Dance electronic, whatever you want to call it, happy hardcore, hardcore trip hop. It's here, it's arrived in mass. Let me give you a little history lesson from my perspective because this is really about change right now. All these industries that kind of controlled the world, if you take the railroads before cars came in, you know, the railroads controlled transportation basically, and somebody said to them, you know, you really should get into this automobile business. And they said, you know, nah, there's no roads, there's no gas stations, they don't hold enough people, can't make enough money. You know, then in America, there was this company called AT&T, Ma Bell, they controlled, like British Telecom, they controlled telecommunications. And people said, hey, you really should make a phone people can walk around with. And they said, nah, we like being tethered to a court. In the 60s, IBM dominated computing. People said to them, you should make a little computer people can have on their desks. And they said, nah, we think people are going to have little thin clients and it's going to be a mainframe driven world. And then when I was growing up, I was watching television in the States, you know, here it was English, BBC 1, 2, 3, whatever. States was channel 2, 4, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13. And somebody said, you really should have all news, all weather, all sports, all sex, all movie, TV. And they said, nah, nobody wants to watch just a linear channel. It's not going to be enough people. You won't get enough advertisers. And MTV, people said to them, you know, you really should put your videos on demand. And they said, no, people don't want to watch that stuff on demand. So what happened was each of them got eaten by the person that actually went and did all those things. Right? Singular bought AT&T. The automobile companies basically put the train companies out of business. IBM sat out the greatest revolution in personal computing history. What happened was they all remained attached to something. It's like an old technology for valid reasons. And they blew it. They blew their market position. So the reason I start with this is because 25 years I've been in the electronic and dance business watching it, waiting for it to happen, obviously from a US point of view in the US, but really globally and we're here and it kind of boomed, right? So the question now is, can this industry change and make sure it keeps its position and not end up like AT&T, IBM, Southern Pacific Railroad, MTV? CBS, ABC, et cetera, in the States. So if you look at it already, let's look at companies for a minute and what's changed, because you've got to see how radical this really is. 10 years ago, when my buddy Bob wrote about this, the people that controlled the business, radio, retail, record labels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they were the power, or the gatekeepers, they kept underground music underground, et cetera, et cetera. In the last 10 years, there was literally wholesale replacement. They're all gone. So if you think about who you want to be in today's world, it's not Polygram, it's not a radio station, it's not HMV or Tower Records, it's Twitter, it's YouTube, it's Facebook, it's iTunes, it's Google, it's AEG or Live Nation, it's Amazon, it's Spotify, it's Sonos. Those companies didn't exist 10 years ago and they are the power. So it's weird to think that in 10 years or so there was a complete, and if you saw the pictures of the horrible tornado in Oklahoma, Whatever's going to come back is going to be different than what was there because it's flattened. I think that's the same that's happened to our industry already, literally flattened. Power, right? Power used to be the big label bosses. Again, radio retail. Now it's promoters. They were at the bottom of the food chain and they're at the top. It's managers. It's agents. It's the artists. And frankly, it's digital internet players. Distributions change massively. Nobody goes to a record shop. Last I checked, not that many, okay? Everybody's on their devices, blah, blah, blah. Huge change. Business models changing in front of our eyes, right? It's no longer sales of records. It's not even really sales of files, even though iTunes is still big, Beatport's big. But that's not really where it's going, is it? It's really going to a streaming environment. But wait, we actually get ad revenue now. YouTube's writing $100 million checks and actually sharing it with the industry for the first time in history. There was no ad ever shared with our industry before. Big changes. Recording has changed from studios to laptops and Pro Tools. Decks changed from turntables to MIDI controllers. Records changed from 12 inches and mixtapes to playlists and custom streams. And obviously the consumers have changed, all right? So it's just a lot of goddamn change. And the question is, can we? So where are we kind of now real quick? We're in this really deep transition. Everything's changed, as I just said. Consumer habits have changed. Nobody does anything but go to YouTube or Spotify or iTunes or whatever, make their playlist. They're getting into that world, right? Starting to hook it into their car, hook it into their home systems. 
Subscription's starting to take hold. Streaming services like YouTube or Pandora are bigger than anything this world's ever known. Files, kind of over, but some people clinging on, but realizing that, you know what, 10,000 files on your hard drive sucks. It's hard to, it just sucks. Here's the good news. People like music. They love electronic music. It's huge. The whole business is on the edge of a turnaround. The filters are changing. Pitchfork, hype machine, beat port, etc. That's how you're getting your music. It's not the enemy anymore, right? And the other big thing is we're going into this age of giants, right? And I'm not talking Live Nation. I'm not talking WME. I'm talking Google, Apple, Amazon, Netflix. These are companies that have 500 million Facebook to a billion users. It's never happened in our world before. And if you think it's going to be easy to compete against that when the same accounts are getting your movies, your books, your apps, it's not going to be that easy to separate all that account information and not just have your music come in. So we're in the age of giants and uh, a deep, deep, deep transition. And you know, in our business, the physical CD will survive. 12 inches of vinyl will survive. They'll be small. File by file is not going to survive too well. It's going to be going down. Advertising is going to grow. And obviously, the big, big one is subscription or music access. And you'll see that over the next 10 years really play out. All right? So what does it kind of mean for the electronic dance world? One, it took 25 years to be an underground. But I don't know if 4.5 billion is right. I can just tell you it's big, and it's global, and it's growing. And if you take the business, you travel around the world, and you actually see the excitement of the kids to whether it's Steve Aoki or Crystal Castles or another kind of superstar, it's remarkable to see the kids in Chile or the Middle East or everywhere else being as excited about it as they are here in Ibiza. All right? But it's big, money, it's big money now. And with big money comes a bit of responsibility of growing up, one to all the people that gave all that big money. So some of the people in this room got paid. And in industries in the past, if you get paid and you don't kind of change your game, it fades away. And music turns into a fad. The scene turn, turns into a fad. So the era of the underground is actually kind of over. It's horrible for everybody to admit because it's tied to people being cool. Doesn't mean new music isn't there. Underground is kind of over. Lots of people got paid. Money's real. Vegas, Vegas explodes. People say it's not like Ibiza. Thank God. All right? Ibiza's a wonderful place to come to. Vegas not that wonderful. Go there in the summer. All right? It's no fun at 107 degrees. All right? you, you run inside. Does have one good thing, though. It's not seasonal. All right? So people go there all year long, and that's why the money's somewhat bigger. Right? The point is, there's a cultural hub in Europe. There's a cultural hub in the States now. Miami there, too. There's got to be cultural hubs where these scenes happen on every continent, because right? it's a lot to expect for people to travel that much. Spoke about consolidation. All right, Live Nation bought up Insomniac, Cream and Hard. SFX made deals with Beatport, IDT, and many, many others. Patrick made a deal with Sony. Here's the good news. Happens in every industry. Hip hop went through the same thing. Alt rock and indie went through the same thing. Right? This is not new. The question is what happens from here. Now, the beautiful thing if you're Pasquale and you're Insomniac, if you're James Barton, if you're Cream, if you're Gary Richards, if you're Hard, if you're the Tomorrowland folks, is the minute they made these deals, they had resource. Because they spend their whole lives curating music and being in the scene. But the minute they're supposed to get big, they have to turn into accountants, into lawyers, into security experts, production in experts, infrastructure experts. Patrick Moxie has to turn into a global promotion giant as opposed to an underground dance pool promoter. It's not that easy to convert like that. Pasquale just can't wake up tomorrow. He's got whatever million dollar check and go, hey, I'm an expert in infrastructure, operations, and logistics. Ain't going to happen. So what all these folks have done, lucky for them, when they got consolidated is they got resource. They got money, they got tools, and they got people. And now it's up to them to lay the culture everywhere. All right? So an EDC expands to London and to New York, and Cream goes here, and tomorrow land becomes tomorrow world in Atlanta. You're seeing the global plotting of all these cultural hotbeds, and hopefully they will be great. Because at the end of the day, they have to be great both for the artists and the consumers. So you're going to see a real boom now. It's not what happened after, beyond the boom boom. Boom boom actually starts now. All right? So I think that 4.5 million turns into 10 if we grow up, if we pro up, if we handle it responsibly, and we actually <clears throat> give the consumers, as well as the industry, an experience that, because remember, this industry is not being looked at 
as a Ibiza or a subculture anymore. It's looked at as the hot thing globally. It comes a responsibility of both safety, quality of music has to go up, everything. Because you don't want to blow your chance in the sun. So for me, it's kind of what do you do now then? All right, all this sounds good. There's all these people talking to us saying it's big. All right, a couple things just to think about because it's happened to every industry that's blown up before. As I said, hip hop was a direct kind of hit on this. One is, got to build for the long term. Because you can't expect this music's going to be a fad. It hasn't been a fad for 25 years. It's just now mainstream. You've got to invest, you've got to grow your brands, and you've got to grow them globally. Don't stand, don't stand still. All right? You've got to spread the festivals, you've got to spread the clubs. Obviously, the artists have a lot more work to do. And the real truth is, if you're in the business, it's time, as much as it's hated, to bring in kind of the non-cool people, people you kind of hated, the accountants, some of the lawyers, some of the production people, because you got to make sure that you have a foundation under what you're doing, which is really programming and curation, right? You've got to hire the right people. You've got to invest. You've got to act like you're here to stay. Innovation, you've got to redo it all over again because there's a bigger audience watching. So it's not just the things you built 10 years ago and got big. You've got to do it more. You gotta, we need to build stars as an, as an industry, all right? In a lot of cases, hip-hop in the beginning, whether it was Def Jam or Loud, and then you had your public enemies, your LL Cool J's, it needs a whole plethora of stars to populate this new platform that everybody's looking at. So we need more of them, and we've got to monetize all the channels, because we're, this industry is breaking in a world that's social, that's digital, and that's in transition. It's not breaking at the time when you just had to work MTV or radio. So one of the things I want to get to, to this room, all right, is what I think is actually wrong, and where we're not ready and not positioned to take advantage of it. And it's a little obscure, because it's not something maybe everybody thinks about all day. So here's what, to me, is wrong. There's a giant global audience now looking at dance music. They're looking at the people in dance music, they're looking at the brands, and they're looking at the artists. And right now, I don't know if dance music is ready to be looked at that way. Not just because of the infrastructure, capital's there, all the things I talked about. But because if I go into Spotify, and I search on a DJ, all right, and I'm a music fan, but I am not core. I didn't spend 10 years in this business. Could be a parent whose kid is into it and they want to know what all the fuss is about. Could be a hip hop kid who's listening to Macklemore and this, I really want to find out about Maddie. And if you go to Spotify and you type that DJ's name, you're going to get a list of 187 results. 25 of them are of the same song, mixed by blank. Normal consumers, don't want that. That is not a good experience, all right? It's a terrible experience. If you go into Sonos and you click on albums, you get singles. If you click on singles, you get a list longer than Wikipedia. People do not know what to listen to, where to go. I'm not talking about people in this room. I'm talking about the responsibility we all have to curate and program this music to others. To say, here's what's great, here's what you need to understand, here's who you need to listen to, Here's the best record in their collection. It's not just a DJ Kick series. It's not a live series or a mixtape. Because even in hip hop, when mixtapes broke and 12 inches, that is not what carried into the mainstream. Okay? Unfortunately, this is a conformist discussion. But conformist is on your iPod or iPhone, you cannot have that kind of list. It's a bad experience. So we need, as an industry, to clean up our shit, and to clean up our metadata. We need to package things in a way that are digestible to others, not just the insiders of the industry. We need to realize that where people browse for music, and they go to YouTube as an example, and you type in something, and there's a list so long you don't get through it, that that's an experience even in the core music listening process for dance music today. And it is a mess, I promise you. I'm a freak. I watch it all day long. I spend all day on the computer looking. I get turned on to Jamie Jones, I cannot figure out where to go unless I have somebody personally walking me through that catalog. So I think that's something that as an industry we have to take seriously, all right? not just talk about the big boom and the money and the big guys that are all doing whatever. It's something everybody in this room can do. You can do it on behalf of your artists, and you can make an experience inside. Again, try it on Amazon. Try it on Spotify. It doesn't matter. It's awful. And we have to do it, all right? because people are looking for a guide through these artists, trust me. The other thing we have to do is we have this platform. And a few of the people inside the platform, and ironically, in the era of Fatboy Slim, 
Chemical Brothers, Groove Armada, Moby, in, in the eras that took place in our kind of forefathers, um, they were fully formed. Artists, almost more like rock stars, even though they might play, might spin, they might play keyboards. Today, Daft Punk captures everybody's imagination, Dead Mouse does, The Swedes do, Calvin does, Skrillex does, and a few others. But for the majority of our industry, I don't know, and this is not a challenge, this is a question, if all of the DJs have thought about their entire package, their social media, what they're going to talk about, what their image is like. Because we're a culture, while the DJ sort of came up as every man, they're no longer every man. They're stars. And when you're a star, you kind of got to act like a star. You got to be packaged like a star. So again, it sounds conformist, and there's plenty of room for people who don't have image, don't have identity, don't have a discography that you can look at and look at ratings and listen to in some level of a linear fashion. But we need more stars. And DJs have to work on that. They have to compose. The art obviously has to go up. It can't be the same old thing. You have a quality bar that's being raised in the music composition by itself. The interest in these personalities is going to go up. Okay? When you're a star, Gossip looks at you, everybody, you have to be interesting. You have to rise to the occasion of our platform, all right? So to me, number one, we got to clean up our library and our metadata and our messes. We got to make it not like a rave that you have to go from one location to another to another to another to find out where it's going on. You have to go by artist, by genre, and get an experience, experience that's great for a consumer. Two, I said it last time I spoke, I'm challenging artists not to just be defined by their show production. All right, somebody had, in Vegas had said, it's an arms race um, of production. And I thought that was very well said. I want to see the DJ that turns into David Bowie, that holds our interest, that does absolutely wild things and makes brilliant music. And we need a 100 of them on a regular basis. I'm sorry, that's the platform we've created. All right? And then we need filters. The next stage of what we're going into is going to be about filters and curation, playlists, things that are going to be flying all around us. We need to build good filters. Pete Tong's a filter. Right? I'm biased. I work with a guy. He's fantastic. He's been a filter in the BBC forever. It's going to be a filter there in, in America now. Beatport has a chart. It's a filter. You know, There's various sites all around from resident advisors to what have you in the mixes and DJs.com, DJZ. You know, in life, people go to guides. They figure out whether it's Rotten Tomatoes for films or Metacritics or wherever, wherever it is you go to get your trusted information on what's cool, what to listen to. If we went around this room, there's not a lot of heavily adopted filters and curators. It's a huge opportunity. So for me, what does change mean in the EDM business? Well, one, everything's changing around us, and we just got to keep up with the bigger changes. Two, we gotta, we gotta prep. We gotta get this metadata right. We gotta get our artists trained. We gotta build filters. And a lot of this is gonna come from the people in this room. So my two cents as somebody who runs a business in this electronic world is, I wish we could do all this. Don't think it's gonna happen. I think when I speak to groups like this, I hope some of you run out of here, clean up your discographies, think about that. Look in iTunes, see what I'm talking about. I hope some of you go to your artist and you think about innovative imagery around them, not just a new mix by somebody. And I hope some of you go out and build some of these filters and influence the rest of us so that we have great experiences inside electronic music. Anyway, that's what I want to talk about. I appreciate you listening. Sorry, I don't have a cool accent, but uh, it's the best I can do.